Hello friends, Dr. Marta Perez here. Welcome to my channel where we discuss pregnancy and birth every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe. Today's episode is on CMV, which is cytomegalovirus, which is a common and problematic virus in pregnancy. So stay tuned to learn why. First, let's cover what is CMV. So CMV stands for cytomegalovirus. It's a very common, called ubiquitous type of virus that is endemic to the population. You may have never heard of it before, but it's similar to a monovirus in some ways, or it can be asymptomatic. This virus circulates in the population just normally, but it can become problematic in pregnancy, and I'll tell you why. The other thing to know about CMV is that there's two types of infections. There's primary infection, which is the first time someone contracts CMV, and a secondary infection, which is when someone has had CMV and either the latent CMV reactivates in their body, or perhaps they catch a similar or variant type of CMV and have a second infection. And those two types of infections, primary and secondary, are a little bit different. During a primary infection, most adults actually don't have symptoms. So they may not even know they have a primary infection or a secondary infection. Other people might have some vague flu-like, mono-like symptoms, enlarged lymph nodes, fevers, fatigue. Sometimes it can affect your liver and cause you to have an increase in liver enzymes. So there's really a range in what you can experience if you have a primary CMV infection. Overwhelmingly, most people are gonna be asymptomatic if they have a secondary CMV infection because they already have immunity built up in their body and the body fights it and you usually don't get really sick. Rates of primary CMV during pregnancy range from less than 1% to about 4%. So about, you know, at least 96% of people don't have a primary CMV infection during pregnancy, but somewhere around less than one to 4% of people may have CMV for the first time during pregnancy. And again, they may know it, but most of the time they do not. Having a secondary infection during pregnancy is a little bit more common. It ranges around a 13% scenario. So it's a little bit more common to either have that reactivation or a secondary infection than it is to have a primary infection. And that is because by the time most people are pregnant, they have had a primary CMV infection at other points in their lifetime. So that's why secondary is more common. Why do we care about CMV in pregnancy? We care about CMV in pregnancy because of something called vertical transmission. So when someone is sick with either a virus or a bacteria, during during when they're pregnant, some viruses and bacteria can cross the placenta and cause effects in the fetus, while as other ones do not. CMV historically has been one of the most common viruses that can affect fetuses because it does cross the placenta. And the scientific term for that is vertical transmission from pregnant person to fetus vertical transmission. And when vertical transmission occurs, it's actually a common cause of fetal effects such as sensory neural hearing loss, which means congenital deafness. It also can be associated with jaundice, low platelets, something called hepatosplenomegaly, which is the medical term for when the liver and spleen are enlarged due to an infection in pregnancy. It can cause inflammation of the fetal heart, and it can cause something really serious called hydrops fetalis, which is a complication during pregnancy where the fetus has heart failure, essentially, and a buildup of fluid in other body compartments, such as around the lungs, around the heart, or around the belly, and swelling and edema of the skin. And that can be picked up on ultrasound. And unfortunately, hydrops is a very serious condition and is often associated with not only fetal growth restriction, but also spontaneous abortion abortion as well as stillbirth. Vertical transmission is more common with a primary infection than with a secondary infection. Again, that's because a secondary infection, our bodies already have some immunity and is able to fight it. So the amount of virus is less and it's less likely to cross the placenta to the fetus. But with primary infection, it's really the first time our bodies are seeing it. The CMV is able to take over and go to the placenta and to the fetus. So the risk of vertical transmission goes up as pregnancy goes on. So someone who has CMV in the first trimester is less likely to pass it to their fetus than someone who gets CMV in the third trimester. But the effects of CMV in pregnancy are worse earlier on in pregnancy than they are later. So although in the first trimester, someone is less likely to have vertical transmission and pass it to the fetus, if vertical transmission happens, 
it's more likely to be serious. And that's because the fetus is in an earlier state of development. If someone gets CMV in the third trimester and late in pregnancy, they are more likely to have vertical transmission, but it's less likely to actually cause problems with the fetus because the fetus is more developed at that time. The rates of vertical transmission, it's not a done deal 100%. If you get CMV in pregnancy, it will cause vertical transmission. Those rates are about 30% risk of vertical transmission in the first trimester, a range of about 20 to 40% risk of vertical transmission in the second trimester and about 40 to 72% risk of vertical transmission in the third trimester. Now those are pretty wide ranging ranges um, for vertical transmission, but that's the best data we have. There's probably a lot of individual differences between individuals when it comes to CMV. And also, you know, a trimester is kind of a wide range. So think of it more as a continuum, but if you wanna break it up by trimester, those are the stats. How is CMV infection diagnosed in pregnancy? Well, the first thing to note is it's very hard to diagnose CMV in pregnancy because most people who have CMV are asymptomatic and don't know they're ill. So it's hard for test for something when you don't even know you have it. There are certain reasons that we will test for CMV during pregnancy, for example. Some people do have symptoms and are ill, or sometimes we pick up a problem with the fetus on ultrasound, one of the things that I mentioned before, and we're looking for reasons. Why does this fetus have high drops? Why does this fetus have growth restriction? And so we might test for CMV in some of those situations. There are two main types of tests for CMV. The first one is blood tests that look at the antibodies to the CMV virus. Now there's no just yes or no test when you're doing that test. What you're doing is looking at the different kinds of antibodies, trying to look at you if someone has the antibody that's more common at the beginning of an infection or the type of antibody from someone who has had CMV at a long time in the past, or looking at a specific type of antibody and its specific molecular makeup that's called avidity testing. But the thing I want you to know about antibody testing for CMV is that it's very nuanced and it's not yes or no. And it can be wrong because certain people's bodies or antibodies behave a little differently than we would expect. And there's the antibodies are dynamic and they're in changing levels um, in the weeks and months after a CMV infection. So CMV antibody testing can be done, but often it is not a absolute yes or no for most individuals. There is some gray zone in our interpretation of the antibodies because of how our body works. The second way to diagnose CMV infection is by doing an amniocentesis to test the amniotic fluid for the presence of the CMV virus on a PCR. So an amniocentesis is a short procedure where a long but small needle is inserted through the maternal abdomen into the amniotic sac and some amniotic fluid is collected and sent off to the lab. Now, amniocentesis is an invasive procedure. It is overall low risk. And so there may be times where someone is offered or recommended to get this test to confirm the diagnosis of CMV. Obviously, the most important thing here is how can we treat or prevent congenital CMV infection in the newborn. So the problem with CMV isn't maternal health, it's fetal health and the fact that this vertical transmission can cause congenital CMV syndrome, which has a wide range of symptoms, some that are severe and cause pregnancy loss and some that are more mild but can affect the baby after they are born. And so we wanna prevent those things and how can we do that? Well, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is that over decades of research and therapeutic trials, there have not been a way to decrease the chances of congenital CMV infection. So there's been treatment strategies proposed, things like antiviral oral medications that hope to decrease the viral load and decrease the chance of CMV. Also infusions of antibodies to CMV that would help prevent congenital CMV, and they haven't worked. And so they haven't been approved by the FDA because they haven't passed the threshold that we need for a medicine to be approved for that. The good news is that nobody's giving up. Pediatricians, OBGYNs, high-risk OBs, this search for a way to decrease congenital CMV has gotten a lot of attention over many decades and continues to. So there's a lot of new trials out there looking at interventions and prevention strategies via vaccination to prevent congenital CMV. So it's super exciting that this does get a lot of attention and it's the topic of a ton of trials. If you have the opportunity to participate in a vaccine trial, 
for CMV or a therapeutic trial if you're diagnosed with CMV, I definitely recommend that because I do have hope that over the next decade or two, we will find a strategy to decrease the chances of congenital CMV infection. The final question I wanted to cover is that sometimes I get questions about why we don't just screen and blood test everybody either before pregnancy or during pregnancy for their susceptibility to CMV if they've had it before or not. And the answer is that screening for something that has no preventative or therapeutic option is generally not recommended in medicine because it doesn't help us improve outcomes at all. And I agree with this recommendation that we shouldn't be doing screening for something we don't have a treatment or preventative mechanism for. I think it just has the opportunity to increase a lot of worry and anxiety and medical interventions without improving any outcomes. And so there are situations where someone might be tested for CMV, certainly if they're symptomatic, certainly if their fetus has an effect, but overall there's usually not an indication for CMV screening, meaning asymptomatic people before or during pregnancy. And obviously that could change. You know, I really hope that we have an intervention that works and that we will institute screening and susceptible individuals will get the intervention for the prevention, et cetera. But in the meantime, until then, always be someone who's washing their hands and avoiding illness with practical precautions. CMV has been around for a really long time. And so I don't think there's any reason not to do things you've already been doing for that reason. If you're a healthcare professional and you're pregnant, I would avoid taking care of patients that are known to have high CMV viral loads because they're immunosuppressed or something. And I'd be happy to take any questions in the comments. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Please subscribe so you don't miss any episodes and I will see you next week.